I often start with one of my favorite tweets from a postdoc at uh, UC Riverside who says, I'm looking, uh, reading a paper, looking for a protocol in 1997 paper as described in 96, finds 96 paper, as described in 87, finds 87 paper, it's paywalled. And that's a very common and frustrating experience. Um, this is from a biologist. Here's one from a physicist uh, where he says, devices were fabricated as previously described, previously described, previously described, and the original reference is devices were fabricated with conventional methods, right? So good luck while reading the paper and figuring out exactly what was done um, and how to replicate it and build in it. And this is really the mission of protocols.io is to improve what we publish, to make it easier to share our methods long before publishing and preprint or semi-privately. And then after you've published it, as I said, with my own personal experience, to have a place where we can come back to to share corrections and optimizations. Um, I've shared the slides, so um, I don't want to do much with the slides. I just want, because this is really quick, um, to show a little bit of the platform and what I think makes it unique. So our mission, as I said, is to make this sharing easier and more rigorous. Um, Protocols.io is open access, CC by license um, for everything that's public. If you're sharing, our business model is we charge for keeping things private, for private collaborations. If you're in industry and you're never publishing, that's paid. If you're sharing publicly, just as BioArchive, it's free to read, free to share, open access CC BY. And, um, you know, as I said, we started in 2014. We're now at a point where we have over 9,000 public protocols. Um, and here's one of my favorite examples. These are not just PDFs, they're dynamic and interactive. People add videos inside to show you what exactly they mean, grind the tissue. Uh, you can shoot a 10 second video. We have catalogs from reagent vendors so you can detail exactly what you used, what are the materials that are needed, where you've ordered it. Um, and one of my favorite examples is this uh, protocol from a researcher in Australia National University. And if you look at this step in the protocol, it doesn't matter what the details are, but this step, think of it as a recipe for cooking. This step says, do something for two to two minutes, timer in it says seven minutes, and this is confusing. And instead of an email exchange or this being a final paper, um, because protocols are dynamic and interactive, you can mouse over on the step, you can click on it, you can ask a question, and you can see on the right-hand side, one of the researchers reading it said, wait, should it be two to seven minutes? What does that mean? The question goes to the author and everyone who's using the protocol, and you can see the reply right there. So instead of private email conversations and answering, a question, the same question 10 times to different people, you sort of have a public FAQ that's being built up. And with a click of a button, you can create a new version. Again, going back to the first talk we heard today, you can create a new version. Um, that conversation is still there, um, but this gets its own DOI. You can cite specific versions. And now you can see it says that step is fixed. That was a typo. The author made version four and it says, whoops, all right, it should be two to three minutes. Timer is not seven anymore. So it's corrected. And if you go next to the title, there is a compare button that allows you to see what is the same, what's different between the steps, what was modified between the versions, right? So you have a snapshot and a bird's eye view of what are those differences? What are the tweaks and optimizations? Now, obviously, I cannot change your protocol. I cannot create a new version of it. Only the author, the owner of the protocol can. But we do have, just as on GitHub, we do have copying and forking. So I can make a branch of your protocol. You work with grasshoppers. I work with crickets. You're doing this step at room temperature. I do it at 30 degrees. And so I can make a clone of your protocol. It becomes mine. I can edit it as I use it with my equipment, with my strain or species. 
And then when I'm ready, I can share it. And we try to give really clear credit to both the original authors and to show what's the evolution of the protocol. So you can see on this protocol itself, um, you can see that it is a fork from another protocol and you can look at that history. You can click on the forks tab to see what's the evolution of the versions and forks and the same compare and contrast functionality applies. Um, there are a lot of it's a we have a really powerful editor that uh, is kind of like Microsoft Word or Google Docs concurrent editing, but really meant for methods with the reagents, which which data set did you use, right? Catalog numbers, videos, um, all of the things that I'm mentioning. So check it out. It doesn't cost anything to create an account, start sharing protocols. As I said, it's free. You can always get in touch, request a one-on-one -on -one demo for more in-depth. I don't have time to talk about everything we've built since 2014. But for open science specifically, I did want to highlight something. So we have communities. It's not just a giant repository. We have 9,000 public protocols at this point. It's growing quickly. But we also let people create communities where you can organize the methods together. Um, so this is, this is a one year old, obviously, community of people who are working on coronavirus related methods. There's half a thousand researchers in this group, 230 plus protocols for sequencing, testing for um, wastewater monitoring, tracking variants. And because these are communities, when new protocols come in or when updates happen, um, everyone is notified. Everyone knows when there's a new version, new fork, a new protocol added, or when discussions happen that I showed you. So it becomes um, a collaborative method development workspace that's out in the open. You can also have a private side, but I really wanted to focus on the mission and the public side of this. And from these coronavirus protocols, I really want to highlight, because it's just an amazing example, I want to highlight this protocol from um, it's actually funded by Wellcome Trust, uh, the group that shared it from University of Birmingham. This was the first protocol um, on coronavirus that we got on protocols.io, January 25th of 2020. And what I find amazing about it is that the group that shared it, you can see it's actually a fork from there. This is a sequencing of the coronavirus RNA. Um, this protocol is a fork from what they shared in September of 2019, before we even had coronavirus. It's a fork from their Ebola protocol, right? And they shared it's like 100 plus methods. This is funded by Wellcome Trust and UKRI, their work. They shared this Ebola protocol in September. And as soon as they got the SARS CoV 2 sequencing going in January, with a click of a button, they made a fork they change those few things. Um, and again, you can do the compare and contrast, and you can see what was in the Ebola protocol and it's tiny things, right? Um, as, as, you, as you can see, when you click compare, the differences are really small. Let me actually go back to the first version. It's easier to demonstrate. So what they shared on January 22nd, I said 25th, it was January 22nd. If you click the compare to check it against the Ebola protocol, the differences are really tiny. Um, they use the same amount of DNTPs, random hexamers, and in you know step two is the same. Step one, instead of 10 microliters of Ebola RNA, you need 11 microliters of SARS-CoV-2, right? It's a small difference, but it's important. And this is really, critical for methods. Um, that microliter can make a big difference for efficiency. It's the same as my story with that one microliter to five microliters uh, making or breaking the protocol. And this is a beautiful example because they were able to share it quickly. They were already on the platform. They had the Ebola protocol up. They shared it rapidly. In a year, um, if you look at this protocol, right? Uh, no, it's not a paper but there are 120,000 views of it. There are 2,000 exports into PDF, printing it out, right? Uh, 57 people made copies of it and modified it as they use it in their research group to get the uh, whole genome sequencing SARS-CoV-2. 160 comments of it, 
Um, and no, it's not a paper. We're not a journal. It may end up in a paper at some point, um, but this is that rapid sharing, preprint-like sharing that is uh, critical to open science. And before I take questions, um, the last thing that is really special for me in highlighting is when you're not just sharing a supplementary, but you're putting things in the right repository, the same way that we put protein sequences in PDB and DNA sequences in GenBank, um, when you put things in the right repository, they become discoverable. And uh, I showed the live demo, so I skip, skip those slides. And I love this example where a researcher in Chile is asking, does anybody have a protocol for RNA extraction from primary cortical neuron cultures? A postdoc at UCSF says, there's a couple on protocols.io, but here's the one that I recommend for you. And what is what what feels so amazing to me about this example is that when you look at the protocol itself that the uh, postdoc pointed to that should work for this Chilean scientist, the protocol accompanies a paper in the journal Giga Science on parasites of stickleback fish, right? So it has nothing to do with cortical neuron cultures. That paper is parasites of stickleback fish, but because they didn't just add a PDF as a supplementary file to their paper, and chances that somebody looking for protocol for cortical neuron cultures would be reading this paper are close to zero. But because the authors shared it openly in a repository, not only did they make their paper more rigorous and reproducible and easier for others to repeat, but they're adding to a knowledge base where people can find their protocol, fork it, use it for their technique, use it for their species with their equipment. And so, um, I will end there. There are a lot of funders that are now recommending protocols.io. Um, over 500 journals, when you submit a paper, encourage you to put a protocol on protocols.io and link to it. Um, so take a look at the platform, and I'll stop there and would be delighted to answer questions. Oi, and the most, I'm rushing so much to make sure that there is time for questions that the most important slide I didn't put up, uh, this is the team. Um, I get the credit for the work I didn't do. I didn't program the apps. I didn't build the platform. That's my, these are my brilliant co-founders, Alexei and Irina from day one of protocols.io. Alexei has been leading the engineering team and we welcome feedback requests, suggestions, um, and we're working daily even though we launched uh, back in 2014, we're working daily on making it better and making it work for uh, researchers like you.